if we haven't met before, or if, if you're not familiar, my name is Kate Locanti Alcacer. I am the Executive Artistic Director here at Irish Classical. I say here, I'm in my house. <laughs> There's Irish classicals everywhere these days, <laughs> virtually. Um, so uh, I will be leading today's talk back. And we have Elizabeth Palladino, uh, who is our general manager for the company. And I asked her to join me to sort of work the controls, work the chat box, admit people in and out. So she's going to help today. And then we have our dramaturg of the production and of many, many productions at Irish classical, Katie Mallinson. Welcome, Katie. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so Katie is our dramaturg on Seamark. She is also a fantastic director. She directed Design for Living, if anybody saw that production, which was four, three, three, three years ago now. Yeah. Um, so in the fall, it was around this time, um, three years ago. So Katie, you did a great job with that production. And you've also directed at Road Less Traveled and um, at Niagara University. You're currently directing there now. Um, and you work at Chase as well. And just share with everybody what your title is at Chase. Uh, Arts Engagement Coordinator for Chase. So I work in the Education and Engagement Department. Very cool, very cool. So speaking of education and engagement, um, we brought you on for the talk back today. So we'll talk about dramaturgy, um, but also your education uh, prowess for our help with this, with our new initiatives too. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Before we kick off and, um, and get into the discussion, we'd just like to invite everybody to open up your chat box function. Um, and there's a little welcome message there, but truly, ladies, if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. If you want to unmute yourselves, then we can just have, uh, you know, an, an interactive talk back rather than use the chat box because there's just a, a small group of us. So if you want to go ahead and unmute, you're welcome to just kind of like raise your hand if you have a question or if you feel more comfortable typing it into the chat box. I've got it up on my computer so I can see it. Um, so let's kick off. And Katie, I have a question to start us off. What does a dramaturg do, for those who may not know? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, it's sort of like a running joke even among dramaturgs, because uh, you could probably get a hundred different answers if you asked a hundred different dramaturgs. Um, I think the easiest way to say it is that a, a dramaturg is a theater artist and scholar, and it's a supporter role within um, a company or production to help uh, facilitate the development. So that's helping to make connections, it's helping to do research um, or support materials. Um, I like to say it's like a third eye, right? You know, so everyone has their role and you can be very into it. And so the drum trick can help also give a perspective, you know, what is the intent of the play and how are we helping to facilitate it? Um, or the other uh, metaphor that's often given is like a, a midwife, right? They're not birthing the show, you're just sort of helping the show come to fruition. And then also, once the show is developed, helping to make connections with the show and the audiences. So doing things like educational materials, um, but helping to provide the context and make connections between the show and, and the audience and actors. Wonderful. I love that metaphor of the midwife. That is a great way to say it. Uh, I think that is so true too, having been on um, in the process, not as a dramaturg, but as a director and as an actor and working with dramaturgs, um, the resources are really incredibly helpful. It just helps to flesh out the context of the play um, to help the actors also kind of know what research to do. Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky or overwhelming, You're trying to learn the character, trying to learn all the lines, but then to help, you know, with um, the guides, you provide us really incredible guides, packets, um, learning material to understand, especially if it's like a very specific time period. Um, I remember, you know, doing period pieces like how to hold the fan or how to sit in your chair and how looking at old um, uh, um, paintings and stuff to, to look at um, how people interacted during those times, wonderful. Thank you for that little introduction. So I will open it up to the group. Does anybody have a question for Katie? Go ahead, Susan. Yes, uh, what specifically did you have to offer or were questions about for the CMARCs? Uh, great question. So um, most of my work with CMARCs, well, well, was sort of before and then like a book ended, but um, so Fortunato and I, the director, um, we worked on a couple of shows and it, it usually starts with conversation. So, um, you know, sort of talking about the themes and asking the questions and um, he ha he's great with images and inspirational things, you know, there are some poems and books that he 
had been reading. And so we were just sort of talking about those themes. And then um, I would, took that and sort of went off to find uh, some research, as Kate mentioned, that would help um, that images, particularly. He was interested in different images of the sea and um, you know, th that location and trying to understand the fishing life. So creating um, the research guide that kind of dug into all of that and, and what the world meant. Um, a lot of times when working with Fortune, it is often conversations. And I can appreciate this when I've had my director head on as well, is that you, you need to have feedback, you know? So I think that um, for this produ production in particular, there was just a lot of conversations to sort of develop different points or when he was trying to figure out different parts of the character, we would have chats about that um, and kind of probing um, and not necessarily always giving answers, but saying, you know, this is what I hear you saying that you want and then kind of going out to find information to support that. Can I do a follow up question to that then? So can Kate, this may be a real challenge, but can you give us an example of where someone said, or Fortunato in particular, I get it, this is what I'm going to do, what do you think, uh, as a result of what you were able to provide him? Um, so one aspect that was interesting and different for this production is while it is a play and was performed as a play, there was the awareness of the camera, right? So that did change things a little bit. So looking at the opening monologue, for example, which would be done one way if you were um, born one way, but sort of talking with him about areas where maybe the camera could switch in or focus. Um, so looking at the, the monologue that Chris would say and seeing where would be a point maybe where the camera could enter or turn or switch mm -hmm. um, based, that would be logical, right? Like when we're going from out to in, where would be a logical point? And so that was one moment where we talked through um, and I kind of gave him a couple of different options that would uh, correspond to the text and um, then he took that and was able to go into the filming. So, so that's one of the examples um, that I could give. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah. Another question for Katie. Go ahead, Marjorie. Do dramaturgs later become directors? Um. <laughs> they can. No, it's funny. I, I was at a conference a, a, about a year or two ago, and they were talking about is like there's different ages for theater, right? It was the age of the actor. The 20th century is the age of the director, and the joke was it's now the age of the hyphen. So it's like dramaturg director, playwright dramaturg, dramaturg actor. And so I don't think all, not all dramaturgs become directors, but I do think it is, um, I can, let me go backwards actually. I think that there are a lot of good people, a uh, lot of good dramaturgs are in the other professions. So some of the best dramaturgs are lighting designers and costume designers, um, as well as actors or directors, because it's, to me, it's more of a philosophy and a, an approach um, that, anybody can bring to it. And um, so for me, it did evolve into directing because that was a skill set I like. Um, and others do do that, but some might find other avenues to explore in the uh, artistic field. Thank you. And even as a director, I still need my own dramaturg because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I'm just talking to myself and that. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question or thought. Do you, when you have a dramaturg, when you are a director, do you have a similar conversation with them as you would receive as a dramaturg? Or do you feel like it's kind of a different situation when you're on the director side of it? It's definitely a different situation. And it's interesting um, because I, I still need someone to, you know, even though I know it, I need to know these things, but like, you know, when you're in it and you're focused on one aspect, sometimes you need someone to say, hey, that's actually not making sense. Or um, you miss out on something because I, you know, you get, you get something in your head and then you get into a rehearsal room and you say, oh, that's not right. Or not, not right, maybe it's not working. And so as a dramaturg, you kind of, you've collected this whole pool of images or resources or things that you could say, well, what about this? Would this help? Um, and so it's harder to do that, I think, when you're just the director. Mm, yeah, understood. So we've got a question in the chat box here from Kyle Locanti, who's my mother. <laughs> oh, she asks, can you give a specific example of a bit of information you brought to the process that you were then able to see realized in an unexpected way? 
Um, anything about, like that you said you brought a lot of research images, were there ones in particular that Fortune was interested in or maybe Chris and Kristen or the designers or any other um, example you wanna share? Um, yep, so there were um, images of, in some of paintings from um, early 20th century Irish um, artist, especially during a time in the 20s when um, there was a lot of resurgence with that the na uh, nationalism and, and things like that. There was really somewhat romantic um, views of the, the sea and the fishing life, um, which Fortunato really liked to use. And I, I think maybe influenced some of the, the lighting and the color aspect um, uh, that wasn't confirmed with me, but I think that was one of the areas that, that inspired him in that aspect. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised for those of you. Has everybody seen it so far? Okay, yeah, yes. seeing some heads nod. Um, for having viewed it already, I mean, the lighting and the cinematography worked so well hand in hand. And I just want to take a moment to kind of highlight that these were processes that nobody had done before. So for it to be working in such beautiful tandem and being like the first time out of the gate, I really am so impressed with, I mean, our lighting designer, Jason Clark, he's a theatrical lighting designer and to be able to kind of change to a different medium and have it be so powerful. I wouldn't be surprised if some of that um, was kind of based on some of the research because it is so evocative it almost is yeah. how you look at a Caravaggio painting and you just see the light you know and how the artist uses light in that way it's he really paints with the light in this production and I know that they had a lot of time working with Pan American working on light tests because how light looks on screen is totally different than how it looks in real life um, and even the dimmest light the camera still picks it up so it's really I love the the dichotomy of lighting between Timothea's apartment and Colum's hut, <laughs> fishing hut, um, is what it says in the script, I think. Um, and yeah. so it's just so gorgeous. Uh, one of my absolute favorite moments of um, lighting design in it is when Colum is done doing his eulogy at the Wednesday Afternoon Club, and the last shot is just him at the lectern and then the light fixture and then the shadow of the light, or the reflection of the light fixture. It's so beautiful. and. Yeah, I know that how Fortune Works is so imagistic and so lyrical, and I wonder if some of that was, was part of that. That's really, really good question. Thank you for that answer. Um, anything else for Katie? It might be it might be a question for everyone connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the difference of being in the live theater in the um, in the Irish classical theater itself, and then doing this as a film. And what we see on the screen is the only thing we know of it this time around. But were there surprises for you when you finally saw the finished film? Was there something you had not expected? Or maybe when you're seeing rushes beforehand, if you were part of that, the lighting and the, the delicacy of it and the effectiveness of it might be one thing. But was there something else? One of the things I did notice, I'll just share with you, was the the scenes where we were looking in from outside the window, a number of those, those you could not do on stage. It just, yeah. you couldn't do it. I wouldn't see it if you were looking through the other side or where I was sitting. And I thought those kinds of things in particular, but was there something that really surprised any or all of you with how that came out? I can just kick it off. I mean, if anybody wants to jump in, ladies, um, viewers, I'd be so interested to hear, you know, what, what your um, experiences were watching it as well. Um, but um, Susan, there are a couple, there are a couple things that come to mind. One is you're completely right about the furniture, like the scope, the height of the piece, the set pieces. You can't put anything in the Andrews that is higher than feet because you can't see over it and and so David Dwyer actually in his Celtic Connections episode they're all on YouTube and the website just a little plug there they're all they're all up there if you want to go back and look but the one with David Dwyer he talks about that he was so excited to design in there in full scope especially for like a 18, late 1800s turn of the century um you know she says her set or her apartment was a music room so you know it has a kind of victorian or um edwardian architecture to it so he was happy that he was able to actually design things that were you know of real height um but you're right there's no way that we could open like look through the window you'd be shutting out three quarters of the playing space 
an audience. Um, and then, so it was interesting to see those moments, kind of knowing if you had been in the Andrews, knowing that they wouldn't have worked otherwise. Um, the other thing is that I think they did such an incredible job. And I actually had a conversation with my mom about this. We were watching it together that they were able to show, reveal that the, char the actors were in the same space at certain moments. And a really great example is at the end of the first scene when they're reading letters back and forth and then they do like a, um, a pan out and they show both actors. So you realize that they're actually in the space at the same time because during the play they would be. And you'd be able to see them, you know, kind of reacting to one another. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Um, Katie, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add or ladies, anything from watching it, Elizabeth, you figured a bunch of time. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's really kind of that fun marriage of the two, right, where um, you can more specifically direct people where to look, which you can't do in theater, especially in some place like the Andrews, where it is different wherever you sit. I think what struck me in, in a delightful way was, um, I guess, just say the liveness of it. You know, there, there's the um, the challenge, right? You're recording without an, an audience there. I mean, there's the production team, um, but it still had that feel, to me at least, of a live show. And having not been able to have it for seven months, it was, um, it, it felt like that. It felt like, it didn't feel like a movie. It felt like theater. Um, as much as we can, you know, have the screen and, and the chemistry and the energy and, and all that aspect of it, um, it's, that's what I really enjoy. <laughs> We actually had many conversations leading up to filming how much of the Andrews we should show, the front row of the seats, the ramps, the, the, the lighting instruments. We made a conscious choice to show that, those things because for those of us who know that space so well, we would love to be reminded of what it feels like and what it seems like. And it's fun. It's fun to see those things. During, it pops up every once in a while throughout the film. And then there's other moments where all of that, because of the lighting design, all of that disappears. And it's just this black void behind them, which is also really appropriate for the play and for the themes. You know, they're really just in like this existential moment for both of them. So I think that they did a really successful job of kind of moving back and forth between those two things. Um, Susan, you had brought up watching like early versions of it. There's so much more editing that happens actually, like cutting between the two. And we actually moved throughout the editing process to do longer shots. And I don't mean like what you see, but like the length of time before something is cut into another shot. Because at the Andrews, you would be able to see both actors the entire time. And so we wanted to create more moments where you could see both of them reacting to one another, like how you would see a scene. Um, but every once in a while, you know, there's these gorgeous shots of just like the back of one of their heads. And we also did that on purpose because at the Andrews, you, you see the backs of, of actors and that's like one of our hallmarks. So we wanted to, to kind of put those things in too. It's a really good question. Uh, we've got another one in the chat box here from Kyle. Um, to Katie, how did your job as dramaturg differ from, us differ from usual because this was a filmed production? Great question. It's a great question. Um, I will say that I um, it was a, it was more separated. So you know, I had conversations with Fortunato. I was because of the process. I wasn't necessarily in it as much um, at, during the rehearsal. You know, it was more of just checking in with him. Um, but then also, you know, going back to that earlier statement about if he had questions on um, shots or things like that. So just being mm. uh, a sounding board for that. But I would say otherwise, it actually was very similar in just helping to tell the story. And that's something that I, you know, having a lot of conversations with people lately, you know, how do we do theater in this new medium? And at the end of the day, it's telling the story, right? We're, we're just trying to make sure that comes through in, in whatever way. And so for this production, it was still kind of helping to support it in that way. Um, I will say that the other end of it, you know, Kate had mentioned the beginning, the educational aspect, that has changed. Um, so trying to find more ways to connect with people who can't come to the theater. So doing like a virtual study guide, um, where it's maybe before would have been a, a paper one, um, trying to do it in a new medium to connect with people who can't come to the space. Um, so I would say the difference is more in, in how to connect the show to the outside world. Um, mm -hmm. the shift. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, to um, kind of piggyback on that, the virtual study guide was a little brainchild we had. We have our student matinees. Maybe some of you have attended them when the students have been there. They're really exciting Wednesday morning shows, um, but we can't do that during this production. And so we are still having our group, student groups view the show. So we wanted to offer them a student guide. And it was just a, a like a late brainstorm uh, only just a couple weeks ago how can we you know figure this out so we decided to do a virtual study guide so Katie recorded herself doing like a 17 minute lesson and there's like lots of images and research images and and um, reflection questions and exercises and our educators have fed back that that was a, it's been a really really um, exciting and new and different way to do things um, and also really helpful to lead students through because as you can imagine, it's, it's a little tough to access this. Think about being like a high schooler and kind of watching this going like, what, what does this have to do with me? Or how can I, you know, move my way into this story? And so we, we picked out some really um, interesting themes and moments for them to, to look at and reflect on. So it's, that's been a, a blessing in disguise from this whole project. You know, you just look at things that you want to keep and move forward. Even when we are able to gather again for live performance, we'll probably still keep the, the virtual study guide. Other questions for Katie about the process? Um, anything about it? We've been around the project for a while now, so probably between the three of us, we could answer any questions you might have on just the show in general. Well, I do have a question about the show in general, the substance of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the 21st century, I think we've now gotten used to a lot of these uh, continental divide relationships. Uh, and uh, probably when this was first done by uh, Irish Classical, I think it was, what was it, 27 years ago? 27 years ago, yeah. That may have been um, a very different reaction to the end and, than we see today. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've gotten feedback, if you have thoughts about that, or how the actors themselves uh, or anyone involved with production thought about that. You know, or feedback from the audience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that, uh, so I've had some friends and family text me like right after it ended, like, re like as the credits are rolling, like just sending me a text and saying like, I'm in tears, or I just, I have longing for them and have this longing for this, this feeling of their longing. You know, it's like this empathic um, connection. And it's so interesting to me, it's that in today's day and age, I agree with you. I think there's so many more long distance relationships and we're used to connect, God, especially now, right? This is one reason why we chose the play because it is so timely. Um, but I think then it's like the words become the relationship, like the experience of being together is not as magnificent as the interaction between them, the correspondence between them, that becomes where the relationship lies. And to talk about how it affected the actors, I was, they, I went every d day of the shoot days um, for chunks of time, but because of the social distancing, a lot of people couldn't be in there, you know, so I would drop in from time to time and I was there at the very end of um, the shooting day, the last day. And Kristen was doing the scene where she, like at the very end, you know, she opens the box and decides, she opens the pen and decides to write back to him. And she was like beside herself. Like it was so hard. You can hear her voice choke up as she's saying those final lines. And it just had such a deep effect on both of them. I can't speak for them. Um, and I don't certainly don't want to, but they were really moved with the process because it was such a once in a lifetime process as well. Like it was the first time we were doing this. We decided, Elizabeth can speak to this, we decided so closely before actually doing it that we were gonna do it. So we didn't have a lot of lead time because we didn't know that we wouldn't be able to gather. You know, we had to make sure we had all of our ducks in a row before we start the production. So it was just all very fast. And so by the time the last date happened, we would have just been opening a show for a four week run and be able to like live with this and breathe with these characters. And these two stars, and I really mean that, like stars, Chris, Kristen, these masters were able to kind of encapsulate the journey of a four week run into four days of shooting. And you really are only shooting those scenes like, four times in a row and then you move on to the next 
scene. So you don't get to go back and like try it again. These are not film actors, not that they haven't done it, but what they do all the time is theater. Um, so just switching into a completely different medium where you don't have the audience interaction, um, you're not feeding off of that. It's an, it, it was so emotional for all of us. And that really comes across, I think, like their own emotions throughout the production because they just didn't have any time. It's like your, um, your immediate reaction is what is captured on film. And it's so real. And they're such dear friends and really good friends with fortune. So like the three of them had the shorthand and I mean, I get emotional talking about it. You can hear me like <laughs> get so charged talking about it because it, it was just such an incredible experience. And then it's over. It's a lot like the play. Like we had this moment and now it's gone. We can view it and relive it, it like rereading a letter, but we won't be able to go back to the space and do it again. So, so I'm just struck as a follow up to that. I'm just struck with how Victorian it is in a way. When people wrote letters, they wrote substantive letters, they kept their letters. We have these letters versus our tweets and emails and whatever else is Instagram, whatever else there is. And they're often, um, well, certain people aside, the daily activity that are in these is like pizza's coming at six o'clock. Okay, I'll be there. You know, it's not soul discussions. Yeah. Oh, it's such a, yeah, it's such a great point of reflection because it's all they had to live by. Like she has a phone put in her apartment during the play. So it's not like they could call each other before that, you know, it's all letters. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah. You were going to say something, Katie, on that? I was just gonna say that I feel like, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I feel like even though it is a different art form and it's Victorian in many ways, I also felt it was sort of prescient, you know, that in this sort of long distance thing, right? Like now we have online dating, you know, it's kind of like, to me, it was like a, a version of that where you talk to someone for so long, maybe not a year, but for a while before you meet them. But regardless of the means of communication, whether you have telephones, you can tweet or whatever, you can still disconnect or you can still have missed connections. Um, and for me, that theme and that story and those characters, like that is something I think we can all relate to, whether you can physically get to that person or not, if you aren't on the same page in a certain way, like that loneliness um, to me is, is timeless. I don't know if that makes sense. So true, yeah. I think one thing that really struck us too was was the just the question like do they or don't they you know like do, <laughs> what happens after <laughs> you know that 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 element yeah. to it and are like are you a optimist or a pessimist like where do you what do you think you know and um and I think that it's that's a really um, magnetic mind space to be in. And it's, it's fun in today's day and age to kind of put us back to a place, Susan, like you're saying, where it's, you just sort of dream along with them and you don't know exactly what happens afterwards, but you know that she opens, like takes the cap off the pen and decides to continue to correspond. Um, and it's, it's just gorgeous to see that even in today's day and age, like with our, our like, pizza texts, <laughs> so it's a funny way to say it, it's so true, that, um, that human interaction can happen across the miles. And we find ourselves in these moments of isolation now. I mean, even here, right? Like doing it like this, but we can still somehow connect with one another. Like we forage past it. Um, and and that's, that's really beautiful, I think, too. It's like the disconnect and the connect that happens throughout the course of the play, kind of like pushes and pulls us like the titles you know it's it's a really gorgeous play I, I just so happy that it just kind of worked itself out that way we were looking for something it's our 30th anniversary season so we were looking at a play that for a play that um kind of spoke to our roots and uh Vincent you know and Fortune said what about sea marks and we said yeah let's do it so it was it was a tr another blessing in disguise Marjorie not only did she take the top off the pen, but as, as I recall it, what she wrote was dearest, which she had not used in the earlier correspondence. You're so um, right. 
we hang on these words, right? Like, mm -hmm. I did, you know, mm -hmm. Chris is a brilliant actor. And so he says, truly yours. And that's like our hook into it. Now we know <laughs> to like, look out, listen out for those things. And yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah. She decides to, and it, our heart swells, you know, it's like <laughs> this beautiful moment. <laughs> yeah. That's such a good point. I'm trying to picture him Where's opening the sequel? letter. <laughs> yeah. I know where's the sequel, right? I know it's, we just, we want to um, be their champions, but on the other hand, we know that they have their whole other lives. Like we understand they're not kids. That's what we, it's really important. It's funny in the play, Katie, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it says the age range for these characters can be 35 to 65. Do I have that Whoa. right? Do you remember Katie by chance? Is that right? Yep. Um, you do. It's, yeah. It's yeah. quite, mm -hmm. yeah. We chose mid about midway-ish. I mean, maybe a little bit on the younger side, but um, but old enough, especially in our day and age where we see 45 year olds and we say, okay, they've lived a life already. Like they really have um, put down their roots or maybe a couple lives already. And so are they ready? She even says, if I was a green girl, I'd go with you in a minute. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of challenge of like, what do we give up to have this connection? Oh man, it's it's like makes me want to go back and watch it again right now. <laughs> like after, <laughs> after this talk, yeah. So it has. Oh, it's been a half an hour. My goodness, I lost track of time a little bit. And we had such a great discussion. Would anybody like to ask one more question before we end today's discussion, or a comment or anything? Well, I just want to say thank you. Really enjoy. Oh, Susan, are you saying something? I was just going to ask. Do you think you could do it again? <laughs> do, do, do another another one like this where you film it uh, you know it's like I know it's a big effort but you know it, it was wonderful thank you so much I um Elizabeth it's worth your effort yeah oh no we Elizabeth and I can attest that we so want to we really do because it's it has been such a beautiful process um, and such a way for us to live in the art. The arts save us, you know, they give us something. They give us a levity in these really difficult times. So it is our hope that we are able to do another one. We're, we're a little bit um, in a holding pattern right now, just based on some other stuff, you know, um, in the, the bigger picture. But but yes, artistically, we, we really would love to do another one. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that everyone enjoyed it so much. And tune in to our other talk back. Elizabeth, thank you in the chat box. She has put the other one. So we've got one coming up on Thursday, this upcoming Thursday at 730. Director Fortunato and our filmmaker from Pan American, um, who, who shot and edited the entire film, Travis Carlson. So they'll be on Thursday. And then a week from today, we have three of our designers, Vivian, our costume designer, Susan Drozd, our makeup and hair designer, and Roy Walker, who did our props. So they will be on the call Sunday um, at 2 p.m. They are all a half an hour, they're free uh, and open to everyone. So check out CMARCS again, <laughs> watch it again and then come back to the talk back. Thank you so much for your time with us this Sunday. Go Bills, I have no idea what the score is. I hope you're winning. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, ladies. Have a good rest of your day. And thank you. Well, thank you. So long, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>